Having looked at ethical egoism, where the focus is on the benefit to the self, we now move on to look at one of the classic um, theories informing normative ethics, utilitarianism. And in utilitarianism, we move beyond looking at the effect on you, the individual, but look at the effect on everyone involved in the decision. So let's hop into it. So utilitarianism is claiming that the right thing to do is the act which maximizes overall good or the overall happiness would be another way that it's being put. So what we need to do is to predict and analyze the consequences of our possible actions for everyone affected by them. If the proposed action results in really positive consequences, more positive than the alternatives, then that's the morally right thing to do. And again, we're morally obliged to do that, and it's morally wrong not to if we subscribe to a utilitarian approach. So utilitarianism is a consequentialist approach because really what we're looking at are the consequences. They're the only things that are morally relevant, not how we arrive there, only what happens as a result. What we do is we extend the idea of egoism where we look at the impact on self and, and have the scope of the consequences to all relevant stakeholders. So we're looking at the good of everyone who's involved. There are different variations or versions of utilitarianism as to what good needs to be maximized. We're gonna look at mainly traditional or classical utilitarianism where we look at overall happiness. So the aim of a moral act should be to maximize the overall happiness of those who are actually affected by the decision. There are some alternatives around at the moment um, such a, that, that give different interpretations of good, but I think looking at that overall happiness is a good way to go. There's a long history um, behind utilitarianism. Two classic um, philosophers in the area, Bentham and John Stuart Mill, are most closely associated with it. Bentham came up with a kind of calculus to work out how do you work out what is good or pleasure or happiness. Okay, so how do we work out how much happiness there is? And uh, he said that there's these seven kinds of things that we need to look at. We need to look at the intensity of the effect, how long we'll be happy, how certain we are that we will be happy as a result, um, how close our happiness is to the act, Fecundity, what a, what, a, what a great term. Well, what that means is how sure are we that it will bring on pleasurable associations? Okay, so uh, think of it this way. Um, you might eat some food. Uh, that food actually might, be, um, might have some bacteria in it and give you food poisoning. So there is a small chance that even eating a food you like won't bring on a pleasurable state. So that, that's dealing with fecundity, right? Um, what's the likelihood you're going to get that pleasurable state uh, out of the food? It's also closely related to purity, right? So um, uh, are we sure we're, got, we're not going to get negative effects from the act that we take and the extent to which we get this happiness? So really what we're saying is there's many dimensions to pleasure or happiness. Um, a more intense happiness is better than a less intense. A longer lasting, of course, is worth more. The more certain you are you will get happiness out of the act, um, the, more ha the more happiness in our calculus. The closer that to, the closer the, between the happiness and the act, the, the greater we should emphasize that act, and so on with the various dimensions. As you can start to see, it becomes quite a complicated process of actually calculating happiness, even for a simple act with an individual. So what Bentham's arguing is when we have an, a, a, a proposed action or, or some alternatives, let's keep it simple. We've got two courses of action, lying or not lying. Okay, how do we determine which one we're going to do? Well, what we've got to do is got to take the act of lying and look at all of the happiness and unhappiness for all of the people that will flow out of it. So we look at each individual, we get that person and say, will they be more, will they be happier or more unhappy? 
and we calculate how much happiness or unhappiness. And we do that for everyone affected by the decision. Then what we do is we add it all up and we get an overall happiness score for life. We do that exactly the same, except we do it for the act of not lying. Then we compare the two figures. Which one produces the most happiness for everyone affected by my lying or not lying? And the one that produces the most happiness, that is the morally right action to take. We are morally obliged to do it, whether it's lying or not. It all comes down to the total net happiness. And as our slide here shows, Bentham is giving us an approach that provides a form of calculus, a hedonistic calculus um, in terms to determine what is morally right. Here's a specific um, example to give us a better idea rather than it just in words. Look how we have three options. One, two, three. And we have one, two, three, four, five stakeholders who are affected by these options. What we do is for Anne, option one, she will move plus two happiness. In option two, she will be plus nine happiness. And in option three, she will be plus nine happiness. A contrast Ellie, under option one, she is plus two happiness. She is zero or unchanged under option two. And under option three, she gets, she's unhappy actually, it's minus two. Now, the way that our uh, hedonistic calculus works for utilitarianism is to add up all of the happiness under each option. Okay, so option one, total happiness is 10. Option two, total happiness is 11. Option three, total happiness is 12. The morally correct thing to do is option three. Why? Total happiness is maximized. It doesn't matter, right, that some people were unhappy as a result. It's not about what maximizes the happiness among most people, which would be option one. That is not what utilitarianism is about. Utilitarianism is about total net happiness, option three. So as we've just seen, what's relevant is the total net happiness. And option three is what is, again, I can't emphasize this enough, morally required under this framework. And option one and two are considered unethical under this framework. The distribution of happiness is not relevant. We can also see that when we do this in calculation, we include both pleasure and pain, both positives and negatives. That gives us our overall net happiness. Everyone's increase or decrease is equal. No one's happiness is considered more important than anyone else. And these calculations should consider both, right, both the short term and the long term. Just as with ethical egoism, there are some problems with utilitarianism, and we've been hinting at some of them as we've gone through. One of the problems that we run into is, can we really accurately predict what's going to happen when we take an act? Can we even know who's going to be affected, in what way and how much? So really, these, this theory starts to become impractical in most real-life situations. Further, right, there's no agreement on what good or what pleasure should be maximized. Mill was arguing that some pleasures are worth more than others. So reading Shakespeare um, in, invokes more good than reading a trashy novel. Now, Bentham would argue against that. So even what is good in terms of our calculation or what is, what is aiming to be maximized will vary. A third problem that arises from a utilitarian approach is that it really means that actions that we normally would consider okay or, or not uh, you know, unethical become unethical, um, and really it's far too strict. So the example we got here is a great one. Imagine that you've got $1,000 to spend and you decide that you want to go on a holiday, right? And that might produce uh, 100 units of happiness in you. 
contrast that with if you spent a thousand dollars say uh, providing emergency relief in the third world and that you could actually give say 50 units of happiness to a thousand people by spending your one thousand dollars that way so that you would actually end up with 50,000 units of happiness. Well then, the only ethical thing to do is to spend your money um, overseas on that aid relief. Many of us wouldn't uh, see necessarily spending $1,000 on a holiday yourself as unethical, whereas under a strict utilitarian approach, it actually would be. Um, and there'd be many actions that we would consider okay, ethically okay would be barred from us under utilitarianism. Probably one of the most damning criticisms of utilitarianism is that actions that we might normally consider unethical might, might become morally um, obligatory to us. What does that mean? Okay, let's take the case of slavery that we've talked about before. We, we, you've got the example of torture you can read, but let's take the example of slavery. Um, imagine that we had 50 people who are going to be minus 100 from slavery, that's 5,000. But those 50 slaves uh, might be able to service in a society, those 50 slaves might be able to service, say, uh, 100 people. Now, if those 100 people go plus 60, because you got half a slave, you know, slave use half their time to look after you, then what we actually find is that's plus 6,000. So under this, right, slavery is we're morally obliged to have a system of slavery if that's the payoff. So one of the real problems that can come from utilitarianism is the calculation allows for the oppression of a minority, right? The big negative on a minority can be overweighed by a smaller positive for a greater number of people. That's very closely related to the problem that um, utilitarianism doesn't count doesn't worry about how that happiness is distributed. We'll deal with that in more detail when we uh, look at uh, fairness, say, in the, in the justice series that we do around week four, week three, week four. So one of the criticisms of utilitarianism is, look, um, you know, if someone gets 200 units of happiness while 90 lose one, is that okay? You know, really, you've got one person gaining and 90 people losing. Is that still really a, an ethical or moral thing to do? Having said that, utilitarianism is very appealing and used a lot in business. Why? Well, we tend to equate happiness in terms of dollars, right? So once you turn happiness into dollars, what we start doing when we make decisions is actually make cost-benefit analysis based upon um, the costs and the returns of particular actions involved. And that provides us with uh, what is what appears from an outside perspective as an objective and unbiased way of looking at issues that don't favour anyone in particular. It's also often used for those who create policies in councils and governments, etc., to work out what the, what's the right thing to do. Well, they just really tend to look at the cost benefits of actually doing it. That's really an extension of utilitarianism where we substitute money for happiness. So hopefully that's given you a quick introduction to those two consequentialist theories. Ethical egoism, where we look at the effect of the individual, particularly me, uh, when looking at uh, alternative courses of action. And secondarily, utilitarianism, where we look at the effect of our action on all of the parties um, who will be affected by it. Next, we're going to look at an alternative way of thinking through these, uh, to thinking through ethical acts. And that's looking at it from a deontological perspective, where we don't really look at the consequences, we look at working out whether what we're doing is actually ethical or not, irrespective of those consequences.